We are back, and I am incredibly excited, not just for the goose, but for this show. Kurt Hustle Collective solo exhibition in Seattle, Washington, presented by Hologram Gallery, T. Moscow Jackson and his partner. Totally awesome. Artist Journal, June 16th, 2023, broadcasting from inner space on the high seas of the imagination in Berlin, Germany. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. And we are back here, and I was going to say better late than never, another late out of the gates, it was a bit of a late night last night, as we do out here once in a while in Berlin, and it was a lot of fun. So anyways, this is happening. So 1997, Kurt Hustle Collective solo ex- exhibition, I had to highlight this, because in terms of excitement, as far as just something hitting my screen and my just reptilian you know the most basic of basic excitement when i when this information was registered in my you know the neurons began to understand what was taking place in this image i became just incredibly excited they kept it under wraps there i think and so again 1997 kurt hustle collective there are a ton of fans out there passionate fans including myself. So it almost makes me want to travel to Seattle. This is taking place July 6th, so it's happening right away. What a, like, this is quite a, would you call it a scoop? I mean, this is quite a brilliant move, in my opinion, from Hologram Gallery here. Because, frankly, if I ran a gallery, I would be all over doing something like this. I, it's like, you know, in a weird, in my, you know, universe, it's kind of incredible these guys don't have major gallery representation. You know, but that's my, you know, unique view of the world here, uh, as with many things. So, quick shout out and thank you to Mick Renders and Pamelo, uh, which, and uh, Leprochant, this is great. It's great to listen to you while I work a little, and I'm really glad to hear that. I'm glad people can be productive during the show. And also, big shout out to Mick Renders, who uh, discusses the GLB that he collaborated with with Dither, and also love the Rakano video game pieces as an avid retro gamer myself. I can't help it. I know what you mean. It's kind of like the synthesizers, you know? It's just one of those things. If people are going to... It's like, I'm just a sucker for, you know, just being into that kind of thing. And, you know, retro video games all over it. So I hear you. Thank, big shout out and thank you to Little Cakes. <laughs> Great Little Cakes uh, for sending this uh, work here. So we were discussing this yesterday and uh, Little Cakes wrote, uh, copy sent out uh, to Pokebelly for mentioning the residence reference in the music that accompanies the Has Dribble Waffle piece. It really did sound like The Residents. I mean, I'm not a total Residents expert, but I think I had the first album called Meet the Residents, and it really, I actually really like that album. And uh, they have a ton of albums. They're the guys, if you don't know, they were kind of early, you know, like in the, I think late 70s, early 80s, kind of counterculture, new wave. And they were the, one of the early people to go anonymous. Like they'd wear these eyeball, eyeball uh, helmets basically or like where you masks and like all around their head with the top hat that whole look is the residence so very cool and what a great crowd to be in with here so I'm just thrilled thank you little cakes and also his dribble waffle uh, so the story of the hour the story of the day I mean it's hard to get away from this story it is quite the situation so this work here sold for 6.2 million dollars it is the second highest generative art sale of all time. And of course, this came from the Three Arrows Capital collection, which got liquidated. These were guys like about a year ago who I think they were liquidated from that. It was one of the early blowups in crypto. What was Terra Luna? I think Terra Luna brought them down, that crypto. And that was a big drop. And uh, so this comes out of their collection. And I think they spent something like, I looked at it, uh, we'll see here. I have quite a few stories here. Uh, But I think they spent about $6 million on this. So it went again. There were several bidders. Uh, And yeah, as the person was here saying, what's the first highest generative art sale of all time? It's actually another ringers. I'll show you in a second here. So Kalo, who has a prominent NFT newsletter, you should subscribe. Uh, there is a free newsletter that goes out and you can upgrade to paid. 
Uh, so here's a first story here, Dmitry Cherniak's The Goose, and it looks like a goose here. And for those that, you know, maybe aren't like super into blockchain and everything, this came out on Ethereum and it's kind of like Fidenzas by Tyler Hobbs, also a generative art uh, series. These are kind of seen as, let's call it touchstones of, you know, generative art on the Ethereum blockchain where I, th I think the idea is, in order to understand it, to be you know what we call the charity of interpretation here, if you want to understand what's going on here and why this could go for so much money, uh, they're seen as kind of like, I would argue, some of the first kind of what, could, what was interpreted as high art on the Ethereum blockchain, so to speak. And so that whole series, as far as I understand, and I'm not an expert on generative art at all, or even a lot of, you know, like I'm not an expert on these at all. A lot of you will know more about these than I do. Um, but that is, so it has a prominent place in the Ethereum culture. Okay, that's so that is part of the reason. So it's kind of a and these were like these random dots and lines. I believe it's all computer code and I believe it's all on chain. Okay, so meaning that it like a lot of NFTs refer to the in, somewhere on the internet or international protocol file service or whatever it's called IPFS to reach over and get the image. And so this is all on chain 100%. So that also kind of adds to its mystique. And there is a mystique to this. So let's just continue uh, looking at the story here. Ringer number 879 by Dmitry Cherniak, also known as The Goose, just sold for $6.2 million, including the premium as the hammer price was $5.4 million, eclipsing the $2 to $3 million estimates. The au auction was co coordinated by Sotheby's New York City as part of the Grails collection. And again, that's the three arrows capital collection. The event was streamed online and was blazing fast, taking around 20 to 25 minutes to complete and having three bidders competing until the end. That's impressive. The winner was prominent collector 6529, and we're going to see some tweets in a second. And here answers that first question that we almost all have. What was the top? Uh, the 10 most expensive ringer NFT sales of all time. So it's actually another ringer, amazingly. And so, uh, Despite the massive sale, the chart doesn't change. So this also so this sold for about six million dollars before, and but it doesn't go up the rankings. It stays at number two, as ringer number one hundred nine. This one here sold for seven point one million dollars. So again, in discussing money here, I don't want to like. I think there's a lot of excitement. The reason why this is generating so many headlines one could argue is because of the uh, the amount of the sale. And it matters. It doesn't not matter, but I think it's just important as the kind of, as the headlines come out left, right, and center is time is the real arbiter of whether an art, you know, of an art piece, whether it stands the test of time in a sense, like people can throw, like, is the, because we can't start going, oh, well, the people work because it sold for $69 million must be 10 times better than this, right? That's where that logic takes you and it doesn't really make sense. And then you go, well, what about every other art piece? And so money is a measure, but it's not the measure. I would argue time is the measure. And I just think it's important to mention that as we discuss this, uh, because sometimes these stories get run away with just the number. So just with that, all that being kind of said, and here's just a quick thing on why is it so valuable? It is a collection because of its minimal and well-balanced composition. It is an iconic collection because of its minimal and well-balanced comp composition. One of the first Art Blocks curated collections, and this is a famous kind of series, uh, kind of curated, I believe. Ringers exemplifies the power of generative art where randomness is at the center stage. And finally, here in Dmitry Cherniak's description, there are almost an infinite number of ways to wrap a string around a set of pegs. On the surface, it may seem like a simple concept, but prepare to be surprised and delighted at the variety of combinations the algorithm can produce. Each output from ringers is derived from a unique transaction hash and generated in JavaScript in the browser. 
Feature variations include peg count, sizing, layout, wrap orientation, and a few colorful flourishes for good measure. And here are some of the traits. So Kalo did an excellent job, I might add here. And then there were a whole bunch of tributes here. So Beeple came out and you were gonna see a bunch actually here. So uh, there were a whole bunch of tributes to this massive sale, uh, which I almost, in a certain sort of way, I almost found surprising, but I guess it makes sense. You know, I guess it's kind of, this is a landmark kind of time uh, in, in the NFT art space on Ethereum you know, especially in the generative art space. So here is NFT now with another story here. Uh, and here is another, so here's another take on why it's so valuable. It, this is one of the reasons that Ringer 879 is considered so valuable. Beyond being a happy and unintentional accident created indirectly from the mind of the artist who built the guiding algorithm, the improbability of an animal shape emerging from the generative randomness adds to its allure, visual identity, and rarity. Quote, in generative art, the artist dictates the relative probability of any particular attribute appearing in an artwork, but the artist is only dictating the probability, not the actual number of times a particular attribute appears. Kate Hanna, Artblock's chief experience officer, explained in a recent video from Sotheby's detailing Cherniak's work. And here is Punk6529 celebrating the win. So, yes, and then here's just a little bit more background. Uh, Ringers879 was minted in January 31st, 2021 by the Kryptonite, who sold it to Pixel Pepe for only 1.26 ETH just four days later. He also received the physical print along with the NFT. It was then purchased by Three Arrows Capital, the now defunct Singapore based crypto hedge fund on August 27th, 2021, for $5.9 million, 1,800 ETH. Notably, Vincent Van Doe tried to buy the piece for 500 ETH, but his offer was declined. So it's this, and again, this is part of the Three Arrows Capital liquidation here. And you see, and we're gonna see some more here, you see some tributes to this work. So again, I, Sometimes I'm late to the party in understanding all this. and But yeah, I mean, it's deep within. You, you start to see, I mean, the importance it has in the culture, uh, in the ETH Ethereum blockchain culture with all these tributes by so many artists here. So very interesting. And this was also interesting. So Art News reported on it. And the headline was quite funny. Zachary Small Sotheby's 3AC bankruptcy auction nets $11 million in what might be a final hurrah for NFTs. You know, from a market perspective, this actually, I think 6529 criticized this headline, but it does feel like, I mean, if what is it called? The market psychology chart, Wall Street cheat sheet. I mean, I do agree with, you know, traders uh, like Gareth Soloway. Uh, the great uh, technical trader here. Let me see if I can bring this up big. Uh, here's the Wall Street cheap, cheat sheet. I do think we're probably here. I agree with Gareth Soloway here. So I don't think it's a crazy headline, but it's a little assumptive. What might be a final hurrah for, I'd say for maybe this cycle is maybe what I would say. And for NFTs, of course, they're always talking about what I call, you know, for lack of a better term, mainstream NFTs. Like they, I don't think Zachary has much of an idea of what's going on on Tezos or elsewhere. Like, I mean, just, I think they're looking at the big picture, the stuff that shows up at Sotheby's, a lot of the generative art and everything. I'm not sure about the awareness. I mean, they may be aware, but I'm not sure about it. So there was something I wanted to see here. Uh, where is it? Here it is. And this is very interesting because we've been discussing the sales, the art sales that have been sort of cratering a little bit. We saw with Basel, uh, we saw with the May art sales, we saw with uh, David Zwerner not sharing secondary sales, right? We're getting all these little kind of evidence, we might argue, perhaps of fissures in the contemporary art market. This was super interesting. Listen to this. So describing the sale here, two Sotheby's employees said it was the youngest audience they had seen in the sales room. Uh, 
with many first-time bidders in their 20s and 30s raising paddles for works that ranged from a few thousand dollars to six figures. One buyer wore a linen jacket and beige Birkenstocks as he competed for archetype number 46, and maybe I can bring that up here, by Kietel Golid. He ultimately won the artwork for $30,000. He declined to comment on his purchase to Art News, saying that he preferred to stay on the down low, on the DL. So for dealers who attended the sale, curious to see if it would draw crowds, they left the auction feeling satisfied. We have a quote from Ariel Hude's head of Pace. So back to Pace. Okay, so Pace is back. Remember we heard from the president of Pace who was saying the market needs to get more rational and that it could use like some uh, a reef some freshening up some fresh material i believe is the exact quote so here's someone from pace verso their nft wing i believe ariel hudes the energy in the room was very infectious you can feel this is a younger market so also super interesting here that there's almost like a parallel art market as we've recognized i think for a long time uh, but who is kind of crypto centric and a lot of them are like these crypto millionaires. So very, very interesting uh, to hear that and just to see that in contrast, uh, you know, now some people uh, have said, and here's the work by Kittle Golid. Some people, I, I'm not sure if I have the comment here, but some people were saying how this might have been, maybe it was in the Art News article, that it might have been positioned at to be during Art Basel and to outperform. Uh, let me just see if I can find that line because that's actually super interesting. Here, here it is. One might wonder if the auction was designed to overperform, especially during a sleepy market when most serious collectors were enjoying aperitifs at Art Basel in Switzerland. So that is interesting as well. So continuing on here, and here's uh, one of the the work that went for thirty thousand dollars to the anonymous collector there that Art News was talking to Kettle Golid archetype number forty six archetype number forty six. So again, you see uh, generative art, and again this is probably I'm guessing all on chain. Uh, so the market for generative art is quite strong. I think people I suspect the reason why is because it's probably seen as the most cutting edge art because it's using technology and coding in order to make the work. That's my take on it. It's pretty simple uh, thought there. 6529, the buyer of the work in question. There may be someone who is, there may be someone who is more bullish than me about the long-term potential of NFTs as a technology underpinning the metaverse, but it is not totally obvious to me who that may be. And as this person was saying, unbelievable conviction levels. So, yes, uh, uh, using it as a measure of conviction here from 6529. This was also super interesting, which is I wanted to show you. So there's actually the beginning and the end. If you go to 6529's feed, it's quite interesting to see this. So I wanted to show you this part. Let me just put up the volume here. Number three. The first, Dmitry Cherniak, Ringers number 879, The Goose, which is our star lot of the sale, showing behind me. From the artist's breakthrough Ringer series, an undeniable landmark that is considered the most significant work of our post-blockchain generative art era. The minimalist and perfectly balanced composition paired with the figurative subject beautifully generated by the algorithm makes this a unique standout within the algorithm art movement. Please note, this work would also be accompanied by a signed print by the artist. So there you go. That is the argument that is being made here. Because it is, we have to remember, we don't need to buy any of this as, you know, assessors. Of, like, it's very important that, like, we, we shouldn't just accept everything. And maybe it is all true, but it's very important that we maintain our skepticism here uh, with everything. Time, it will be the ultimate judge of all this, not the money, I, I would argue. And I think that's a self-evident. But very interesting. And here, if you want to watch the end of the auction, can you can see it going seconds. for $5 million and all this sort of thing. Nice drama at the end of the auction there. This also I want to, so this is where it's going to end up, one assumes, is at the 6529 Museum. And I was curious, there are a few ringers in here uh, already, and here are some of the famous 
fidenzas uh, for those that might not be familiar. So these, I would argue, I, you know, again, I'm not an expert in these things, but it seems to me those are the two most iconic series. This is Tyler Hobbs and everything. I also wanted to look at the market. I thought this was really interesting. There was only one sale on listed here on OpenSea that was registered uh, when you go to the entire series. Like here is the series if you want to buy it on the market, if you want to get a different one. And again, there was only one sale, the cheapest at 42 ETH for $70,000 uh, 16 hours ago. Otherwise, the last sale was six days ago, 25 days ago. And it's interesting also, I mean, these were going for $37,000 two months ago, 35. So one would think actually that there would be more activity buying afterwards, but maybe it's just a sign of the market right now is in a pretty precarious point where people aren't rushing out to drop 70K. And here it is on Sotheby's. And there's just one other thing I want to show you, which is how it looks on the wall, okay? This is cool too, just like the physical rendering of this print here. It looks quite beautiful. I think it's, and let's just print on German etching paper. So they don't say if it's inkjet or how it was printed, just that it's on etching paper. Interesting that they don't say uh, for Sotheby's. And so then there were, oh, and here's the rest of the collection, just to give you the full picture here, Grail. So this was the collection, property from an iconic digital art collection. And so again, this is the liquidation. So these were also very famous, these squiggles, the autoglyph, and here's some Dmitry Cherniak's and everything. So here's just a sample of what I get tempted to call like the sort of mainstream NFT art scene. Like, and, and what I mean by that is those that have sold for the most amount of money, you know, uh, Beeple, $69 million, you know, the ones that are really in the news, you know, so uh, just a kind of, there's that one uh, that we just looked at here. There's another one. So just to give us all a picture here, quite a few Dmitry Cherniak's, and everything. So just to get a feel of the scene, some crypto punks there. And I think I saw actually an article too, where D Dmitry Cherniak wasn't thrilled actually to sell the art with crypto punks. It's actually worth tracking down very quickly what was said there. I think that was in the art news uh, at the end. Here it is. Uh, he wasn't exactly thrilled to see the artwork in an auction with CryptoPunks and other collectibles that aren't so related to the generative art he produces. Now, I thought CryptoPunks were generative. I thought they were, but I, again, I'm not an expert in this. Quote, I have been critical of any projects that try to lump everything together. My ideal circumstance is that the goose would never be sold. It would be enjoyed or donated to a museum. But the NFT was ultimately in the liquidator's wallet and in the auctioneer's hands. Quote, the reality is that this is how our society works. So interesting, kind of a muted response from Cherniak. Uh, I assume it's an interesting question whether he got a royalty on this, because don't forget, uh, 6529 is back or blur the platform that's backed by 6529 got rid of a lot of the royalties. So I'm not sure how it works when you sell on Sotheby's. Interesting question. I mean, because if he got a royalty on that, I assume it's like 10%, which would be something like in the order of $650,000, let's say, or 580. So all very interesting to see how all this play out. And of course, I mean, there's more, like, you see what a huge story is. I couldn't ignore it because, I mean, the art that we look at here is also discussing it, the goose at home. So then you see Sabato here. Uh, there were a ton of artists uh, doing homages to the goose in their own way. And here is Sabato. I love how fast everybody is working here. I mean, cause I mean, this is a news story, it comes out and then here Sabato has his workout within like 24 hours, probably. Pretty impressive, available for 540, edition of 44, there are 22 left. And so part of the drawing series. And here is Popple with a goose. I don't think he minted this. This looks like an eight Badoo work though, doesn't it? Eight by eight here, really nice piece actually. Uh, and another work by Uxine, am I doing it right? <laughs> You've seen the check marks, which I believe were used at, during the Pepe time for some other, I think, was it Vincent Van Doe? I don't remember. 
Uh, but here it is, another goose using these check marks here. Uh, so, and finally, Kay Bleen, a prominent curator on object, uh, posted a whole bunch. So again, Grant Riven Yoon and a lot of the heavy, you know, hitters, uh, people there and more, uh, as you can see. So Des Lucres, Lucresh, people. So here is the full, you know, story here for you. As you can see, the blockchain NFT scene is buzzing. Alpha Centauri Kid. It's almost like everybody had to have their goose, <laughs> their goose rendition. Uh, so there it is. Uh, and I mean, just it's all over, all over the place. Here's another one, Luis Pon, and more. So yeah, it just keeps going. So you see uh, the significance there. And there's Popple. Popple did a great job. Uh, as everybody did. Dan Control. Moving on to other animals here, a snake, a beautifully rendered snake here by Dan Control. The virtuosity of what Dan is doing continues to develop. And this is just another wonderful composition here. And would again, we just saw the goldfish, I think yesterday. So six Tezos, I think that's still on primary, nine left. So nice piece for $4.35, part of the all animals, all an, all an, all animals, however that's pronounced. Uh, so that is selling now. And another one here, another animal piece. This is an artist I've never seen before, but just came across on Twitter here. And here is what looks like a rooster, Bias Decisions. This came out in mid, or was sold in mid-May, came out April 30th. And again, I think this artist's name is, is Cider, C-Y-D-R, just kind of an interesting artist here. Kind of reminded me almost like a, a combination of Graphica, PNG, and Osborne. That's almost what this feels like, somewhere in between here. Uh, and a static version of Osborne almost. Today's Simba, another nice piece here, another animal kitten or a cat and I thought a nice piece sold for 0.1 back in December just to give you a taste for the earth. Ah, this was great. Uh, this microwave here. Very interesting work. Like quite nice. Sold for 0.33 ETH and that was in December. So totally missed this one. Resaca and Hangover. Very cool piece here. Let me make that big. Beautiful. Very cool work. From Cider. Kurt Hustle Collective again. Electric Hustle Land. And so playing off of the Jimi Hendrix experience here, Electric Hustle Land, Electric Lady Land, and these beautiful, awesome puppets. Gotta love the half open mouths and everything. So that is available from Kurt Hustle Collective. And they have they have sold for five and the listing has been canceled. You might be able to put an offer in though, if you want one. And continuing, I wonder, this is part of a new series. So it's probably Kurt Hustle Collective Records, which sounds very promising. So I think that's the first of the series. And Aizo with a gorgeous glitch here of like what looks like a master bed sort of thing, a Victorian bed style bed frame and everything. Just beautiful here. You got to love uh, the colors and everything and all of the warmth in this glitch here. So doing it again and that even super warm gray in the background. Beautiful work available on secondary for 16 Tezos. So sold out and yeah, sold out at seven Tezos and it didn't take long in less than two hours. So that is cool. Plus was Gamma crash. So we saw uh, Yuri J yesterday with the car crash and here's another crash. So that is pretty cool. And a again, it just evokes JG Ballard in my mind here and just a cool kind of 3D uh, rendering of, you know, bent metal. And again, also, you know, there's Warhol evoking Warhol as well with that death and disaster series is that terrifying series by Warhol. This work, Silva Santus, this beautiful glitch work, jumped out at me on Twitter. I almost started with this. This is a beautiful work here. Uh, it's a waterfall, glitch waterfall. It's like a Super Nintendo ROM. And I just love the originality in the ROM treatment. It's a completely different kind of treatment than I've seen so far of glitch ROMs. And I thought just a really kind of 
it, it, the content is also kind of an interesting angle on the glitch ROM. It's almost like taking a part of a video game and turning it into a landscape painting, a beautiful waterfall, and then applying the glitch ROM technique. Really, really cool. 90 Tezo cents. I mean, I picked one up. 65 cents. Can't go wrong with that. And this is Sil Silva Santus, and I believe we looked at the Batman the other day. Farfire, it was called, but what looked like a Batman game. And I think I brought one up here as well. Another one, uh, Sunset. So another Super Nintendo glitch ROM. And again, uh, feels like, you know, sp specifically, it's almost like turning these into like landscape paintings or turning, you know, frames from a video game into basically a kind of narrative painting, which I think is pretty cool uh, and really interestingly done uh, with the big kind of, I want to call these hexadecimal pixels, but I don't know if that's right. I mean, usually it's the color that's hexadecimal. Stipend Pixel with an experimental collaboration here, I think. This is the gen genesis to create the collab with Ferdo Peza, where we combine generative art and pixel art. So more generative art here. It almost reminds me of when you make uh, pixel art with AI, but I don't think that's what's going on. I think it might be otherwise. And so different renderings here of the uh, house, of a pixelated house. So maybe this is the first part, Symphony Home, and then maybe uh, Ferd Ferdoro Peza will do something with this. So cool work here by Stipend Pixel and a couple of others. Also, we looked at, it's almost like these kids against a matrix backdrop here. Uh, street moment number 43, and here's just another child in the playground. And again, the trademark, super cool style of, you know, putting the head here in blue and then everything else in red and then the hands and everything, the clothing in red and everything. So just really cool work by Stipend Pixel. Here's another one. Again, a kind of matrix-like background here, uh, but could be like a slide, someone going down a slide, a kid going down a slide and having fun. And the color reversal here where the head is red and then the clothing and background are blue. So kind of a nice pairing here, aren't they? They go well together. Datura with a quick work here. Indecision, what should we do? And this one kind of mystified me a little bit because oftentimes we see landscapes of sorts with Datura. So, but we have seen also, I guess, these kind of animated abstract works because this one isn't clearly an object. It kind of could be a stone that's kind of coming apart. Let's actually, because we have actually looked, I should say, at other animated abstract works by Datura. Oh, this might crash my mic. I might have to keep going here. I'm going to keep going. Uh, so anyways, a new one by Datura, which looks great, by the way. How much is that selling for? Uh, two Tezos and addition of 100. So that is cool. And how many are left? 50 left, so maybe 50 listed. Cool work from Datura. And another kind of, what would you call this? Is this generative? This is like minimal art. Let me make sure it's running here. This is by Jose Gasparian. So kind of minimal animated abstract art. I may have to restart this too. And let's see if we can get it going here. Jose Gasparia. We'll let that load while, let's see if it works. We'll let that load, here it is. Well, we're gonna go to this one and then we're gonna come back. Lucas Lejeune, Ancient Script. So kind of almost reminiscent vaguely of Popple's works in the size of the pixels here. Uh, we've looked at Lucas Lejeune's work before. So kind of a nice pixel size though. I'm guessing that's something like maybe 100 by 100 pixels. Maybe it says here just 1080p. And so cool subject matter, ancient script, and it looks like it. So almost like a made up script by Lucas Lejeune. You know, Max Ernst actually did that in some of his work, uh, what do we call that again? Here's, th there's a, a asemic writing where the writing is kind of a visual representation, but it's like a, a sign with no meaning, basically. There's a signifier, but no signified, so to say, so to speak. Let's see if we can get Jose Gasparian's work. Okay, it's coming ever so slowly. And otherwise, we might have to show this on another episode here. It's coming. 
Here we go. We'll let that keep loading here. And here's also Lucas Lejeune's work here. And I think we looked at it just a work the other day uh, that was, again, using these kind of vectors that are generative. Uh, continuing on, Lewis Osborne uh, with Party Time. So pretty fun work. It's Friday. Hallelujah. And there is a disco ball with some little figures bouncing off the disco ball. So a very fun work. It's an addition of 100 for 5 Tezos. There are 46 left. And let's see if we can finally... Finally, finally, get Jose Gasparian's work working. I don't think we're going to get it working. It is too tricky, and we'll have to bring it up another show as it slowly creeps over. What else is new as this loads up? I was at a show yesterday. I went to a wonderful art show yesterday at Levels Gallery, and it was actually a ton of fun. It's a photo gallery in Weissense, for those that know Berlin, kind of in the north of the city. And, and it was a wonderful time, actually. And if you go to my Instagram, you'll see some of the pictures, actually, from that show. Great night. And here is the work. Jose Gasparian, a minimal abstract, animated abstract work, just kind of cool. Uh, playing with circles, spheres, and stretching them out, and just a nice, simple work here. Simple concept, uh, and there are 10 available, and none have been listed yet. And continuing on, Stolka, as we wrap up here, Not a Digital Nomad, which is kind of a cool title, and of course, Stolka is an awesome uh, illustrator who often portrays you know, what looks like maybe her and her friends or her life and this sort of thing. And there's the woman artiste book with the suitcase that's open and everything. Just a cool work. One of one for 15 Tezos. Let's see how much time in this auction. They're one day in 14 hours. So that is interesting. I might try and pick that up. And here's another one of one at auction. Kind of playing with a bit of a comic book format here from Stolka. Chapter one, nice to meet you and everything. So you can read the comic. It's, it's an interesting concept to use a comic as a kind of uh, structure for a painting, which kind of feels, this seems like half comic, half painting here. And so interesting kind of combining of the mediums here from Stolka. And here's a painting by Stolka that's also at auction for 15 Tezos. So a few different kind of experiments here. Pouvoir de la Chatte, the power of the cat. And so a, another cool work here by Stolka with a cat, young woman, just a cool portrait and everything kind of has a modernist feel to it. I like how she puts the writing in here too. So very cool, also at auction for 15 Tezos, which these days is almost free. I mean, it's probably like $10. RJ and Explainer Gallery have put out a work, uh, let the market work for you. So again, I'm kind of wondering, has RJ, this is a very important thing if you didn't hear the RJ uh, Twitter spaces, which I highly recommend. RJ is, if some of these works you're wondering, if they seem familiar, but you don't, uh, you know, recognize the composition, it's because RJ, as he was saying, he's using AI to recreate works, and then he will, you know, trace or use that as a reference to make a new work. So he'll take Hockney or Edward Hopper and then get AI to make different versions of those works. And then maybe he'll take one of those or whatever he does, but he's using AI. And here he's also been playing with glitch a little bit, interestingly. So here it is, kind of a reference to trading. The trader is no longer only in the pits of investment banks or shock shackled to a terminal. So Explainer Gallery has been doing this series that focuses on trading as the theme. And so here is a trader. And so a classic RJ work. This one flew out the door at 15 Tezos each. You see it was gone in less than five minutes. So congrats on that. Very cool from RJ. Continuing on, Lily Illo with a beautiful work here. Time's Relentless Melt. And this is on Object. There's already an offer for 200 Tezos on this. Not accepted yet. And just a very cool one of one. So Lily Illo continues to kind of go from to evolve here and kind of raise her profile here in the NFT art space. So this is impressive. 
uh, to see. And it's just great to see her work. Very nice person and kind of like the trademark AI hands here with several fingers. And Zoom with a new work with the mirror here, another mirror work, uh, AI work. And here's another mirror here, which again, I just find so interesting and kind of mystifying in a great way. And just very interesting compositions. Also AI, Artistic Oasis from Serene Sanctuary, only three Tezos. And Stefan Schwarzer, who I've shown many of his works here. And here is just another cool physical work here from Stefan Schwarzer, more from the uh, contemporary art world, uh, Cala La Costa from in Habana, Cuba. Polychromos, so probably colored pencils on paper. 42 by 32 centimeters and Leprochant with a handmade sculpture here, which is pretty cool. So here Leprochant is pretty serious at the sculpture. We saw, I think, the, the, uh, that other awesome one. I mean, let me just show you. I can't remember the name of it, but I remember the look of it. If my internet will load, my internet may not load here. Uh, I think it was Neuralink. Remember Neuralink? That was really cool, but maybe this isn't going to load today for us. Anyway, we will come back. And until next time, my friends, thank you for joining me. Have a great weekend and everything. Until next time, take care.